Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to week eight. In this lecture video, I'm going to be talking about statutory dispute resolution schemes. In the past few weeks, a lot of the discussion we've had pertaining to alternative dispute resolution has really focused on dispute resolution as some kind of alternative to court determination or court adjudication. And when, because we frame it as if it were alternative to court adjudication or court determination, it is as if the ADR processes we've previously, previously talked about, such as negotiation or mediation, it is as if these occur outside of uh, legal proceedings or outside of you know, court proceedings, when in fact, in many cases, much of what we call alternative dispute resolution actually takes place within the court or tribunal uh, legal systems. And uh, much of it is a function of uh, statute, which provides for the use of alternative dispute resolution as part of the resolution of a legal dispute. And that will be our focus in this particular lecture video. Uh, the focus will at least be on two things. One is that it gives us better, it makes us become more familiar with the fact that a lot of the so-called alternative uh, dispute resolution practices or processes actually happen within uh, or within the course of a legal proceeding or a matter that is about to be commenced in court or has already been commenced uh, in court. And it is a function and much of these uh, much of these alternative dispute resolution processes are a function of uh, what has been provided in statute. And it makes us wonder, uh, you know, what is really the role? What exactly is the purpose of having these alternative dispute resolution processes uh, embodied in, in statute? What are they for? Why would the, you know, why would the, the parliaments decide that alternative dispute resolution processes should be embodied in court proceedings? Does it mean that they think it becomes more effective in terms of resolving disputes and in doing so? If, if a dispute is resolved, is it really for the purpose of providing justice to the parties in the sense that both parties are actually happy with the outcome as a result perhaps of an alternative dispute resolution done within the context or within the, within the course of an actual legal proceeding? Or would the driver of the statutory dispute resolution schemes, not really to give justice to the parties, but really just as a way of, you know, moving the parties along so that it exits from the court system and minimize the backlog in courts, uh, as, as well as, you know, just really as a way of case management, rather than focusing on the legitimate interests of the parties and ensuring that there is, you know, justice that is served by the courts to the party. So these are some of the questions we will be considering in this lecture video. And so on completing this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain key legislation in Australia that enshrines EDR processes, how EDR works in connection with the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, how EDR works in connection with family law and civil disputes, the benefits and concerns about court-ordered ADR or tribunal-ordered ADR, and ethical practices and court order or tribunal-ordered ADR. Now, the focus, because you know this is a very broad topic, we can't possibly uh, consider and examine every single statute that has uh, alternative dispute resolution processes as part of the ways by which a legal dispute may be resolved. So we're going to be focusing on a few of them, such as the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Proceedings under the Administrative Appeals Tribunal or AAT Act of 1975 Commonwealth. We're also going to be looking at family law proceedings governed by the Family Law Act of 1975 Commonwealth, as well as civil disputes in federal courts, mainly the Federal Circuit Court of Australia Act 1999, which governs it, as well as the Civil Dispute Resolution Act of 2012 Commonwealth. Now, Although I've kind of mentioned that a lot of these ADR processes are considered court annexed, we use the word in this lecture video more broadly as court or tribunal annexed. So when I say court annexed, I can also refer to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which isn't really a court, it is a tribunal. But you know, but just to kind of 
uh, clarify some ambiguity there. Why is that? Is you know why is that distinction important, or is the distinction between a court or a tribunal even you know does it even matter? And it does at the level of uh, the federal judicial system, uh, mainly because uh, following the Boilermakers case, the High Court of Australia uh, clarified that when it comes to uh, judicial power, judicial power can only be exercised by what are known as chapter three courts or courts, which have been created or constituted under the uh, Australian Commonwealth Constitution. And when you speak, therefore, of uh, judicial power being exercised only by court, chapter, what are known as chapter three courts, it means that judicial power cannot be exercised by administrative bodies or administrative agencies. And these are agencies or bodies which actually belong not to the uh, judicial system or to the, to, the, to the courts, but actually to the executive. So for those who haven't had the chance to closely examine constitutional law, there are three uh, branches of government. You've got the executive, such as you know, the prime minister and the cabinet. And you have the, the federal parliament, which consists both of the Senate as well as the House of Representatives at the federal level, obviously, we're, what we're discussing here. And of course, you've got the courts, which is that you have the high court, you have the Federal Court of Australia, as well as the Federal Circuit Court of Australia, which is now the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia under a, an amendment in September 2021, which uh, made, which led to the amalgamation of the, the previously di distinct courts, which were the Federal Circuit Court and the Family Court. These have now been amalgamated as of September 2021. So what you now have would be the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia which is a lower federal court uh, to the uh, Federal Court of Australia. Now, so going back, so the High Court, the Federal Court of Australia, and the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia are uh, chapter three courts created uh, by the Australian Commonwealth Constitution or created under the, federal, under the um, Australian Commonwealth Constitution. You have bodies, just the administrative tribunals, which actually makes judgments and decisions. But typically, these are in relation to what are known as decisions of uh, administrative agencies. So for example, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal would review administrative decisions, decisions made by uh, bodies which belong to the executive, such as the Australian Taxation Office. It could be decisions made by the Australian Imm uh, Immigration Minister or you know, in relation to visa matters, it could be decisions made by Centrelink uh, pertaining, uh, or it could be decisions made in relation to uh, child support. And so a lot of decisions are often made by, certainly made by, uh, the, by, the, uh, by the executive uh, government, which affects uh, you know, us as citizens and uh, people who live in Australia. And so you've got the, administrative agencies, you've got the court system as well. So when, you, when I speak, for example, about court annexed uh, ADR, I mean that this could be ADR, which is annexed both to proceedings under the, uh, under the court system or the tribunal system. Of course, at the level of the states, there isn't really, well, and so the reason why under the Boilermakers case, there is a clear separation between uh, the exercise of the judicial power and administrative power or review powers pertaining to the review of administrative decisions. It is because of what is known as the partial separation of powers. Because when you look at the executive, for example, uh, when you even though you might say that you've got you have the executive and you know the parliament, they are in a sense fused because the prime minister and the cabinet are actually members of the federal parliament. And so therefore to ensure some kind of a checks and balance there has to be an independent uh, court system, which is why uh, the under the Boilermakers case, a, a tribunal that hasn't been created as a chapter three court cannot exercise judicial powers. But on the level of the states, uh, it is permissible for a court to both be a court as well as a tribunal in the sense that it exercises both the judicial power as well as administrative review powers. So you, for example, in, uh, in uh, Queensland, you have the Queensland's civil and administrative tribunal. So, you know, just a, just a backgrounder. Now, so our focus in this lecture video will be to, to talk about administrative appeal tribunal proceedings, 
under the A80 Act of 1975 Commonwealth. We will then talk about family law proceedings under the Family Law Act of 1975 Commonwealth, and then civil disputes in federal courts, meaning disputes in the Federal Circuit, or, uh, which are governed by the Federal Circuit Court of Australia, Act of 1999, as well as the Civil Dispute Resolution Act of 2011. Now, notably, uh, we need to be aware that apparently at the level of the state, such as in Queensland, uh, you can have other statutory dispute resolution schemes, which we won't be discussing this lecture video because there isn't simply an, enough time. So, but you know, you, we should be aware that as far as civil disputes in Queensland courts are concerned, you can have the District Court of the Queensland Act of 1967 or the Magistrates Court Act of 1921 Queensland or the QCAT Tribunal Act, the Supreme Court Queensland Act, um, Supreme Court of Queensland Act of 1991, uh, as well as the Uniform Civil Procedures Rules of 1999 Queensland, which all provide uh, court annexed, what we call court annexed, uh, alternative dispute resolution processes. I've also uh, previously mentioned when I was talking about, I think, conciliation in week five or week six, that there are also ADR processes uh, in place in some of the administrative tribunals and agencies uh, and at the federal level, for example, you can have the Fair Work Commission or you can have the Australian Human Rights Commission. And then you can also have um, ADR processes uh, in work cover as well as in the Anti-Discrimination Commission Queensland. We're gonna be, we're not gonna have the chance to examine these because it won't really be necessary. Our focus really is to just highlight the fact that a lot of the ADR processes are in a sense co-opted or embedded in legal proceedings launched either in court or in a tribunal or a combination of court tribunals such as the QCAT. Okay, now, one of the first things we need to ponder, because we we often talk about the alternative dispute resolution processes. And the question then is, is it really proper to consider uh, those dispute resolution processes which are embedded or part of or annexed to court processes or tribunal processes, would it really be correct to consider them as alternative dispute resolution processes? Because when we say it's, they are alternative dispute resolution processes, what exactly do we mean? Alternative to what? So um, when we encounter statements such as that, you know, this is an alternative dispute resolution process, as if it were distinct from legal processes, that is a very simplistic way of saying it. And it provides a very incomplete picture, mainly because what we call uh, to be alternative dispute resolution uh, is actually embedded or part of, or in addition to, or annexed to uh, legal proceedings in court or in tribunals. We're gonna have a, a chance to go back to this question we just ponder it, but I'm gonna go back to that particular question. And we also need to consider whether or not, or how important you know, um, statutory dispute resolution processes are in the resolution of disputes. One of the things we should also ponder is, you know, when you talk about an alternative dispute resolution process, and I, when I say alternative, I mean in the sense that it's alternative to the curia or judge adjudication or judge determination. So that's what we really mean by alternative. Or you might say it's alternative to a protracted and lengthy and expensive litigation. That's what we mean. So, so that's what we mean, right? But these are, well, even when we talk about alternative dispute resolution processes in a, broader, in a broader sense, we're mainly talking about the process of how. So the how part is you know, kind of mediation, you kind of negotiation, you can have conciliation, you can have arbitration and so on, you can have case appraisal, et cetera. But these are the processes. But in relation to these processes, you really need to consider what would be the substance of a, decision, a dispute that is resolved. So sure, you have negotiations, you have mediation, you have conciliation, but now what? What is the substance of a uh, you know, a dispute that is resolved. So that's again, something we need to consider because what I'm actually uh, pointing to is the fact that it's one thing to talk about, you know, legal rights or legal positions. It's another to talk about interests. What underlies certain 
hard ball, you know, uh, stubborn positions made by certain parties. What underlies those? And what kind of outcome will actually ensure that the parties are happy uh, with the decision or an outcome or some, uh, or that an outcome based on an agreement is something that they could live with. So that there is a very strong likelihood that uh, whatever agreement is reached by the parties leads to future compliance rather than you know, leading to further conflict. Certainly you can have an agreement. You can even have a court judgment, which, which assumes that the dispute has been resolved, but actually that will only engender future conflict. So for example, you can have a, you can have a court decision in relation to a family law matter pertaining to you know, a parenting order. Um, and so the judge lays down the decision that this is how uh, you know, parents may spend time with their children, et cetera. But if either or both parties are unhappy with the decision, that will only mean that there will be future conflict in the sense that even if the judge says, for example, that you know, during school holidays, child A goes with this and, you know, and so on, how exactly is school holiday defined? There could be a lot of there could be a lot of confusion and conflict in relation to that. The school holiday begin on the Friday prior to the actual school holiday, or does it begin on on a Monday? And what if you know there'll be questions about wh you know where do you bring the child you know which child uh, which school should a child go to? And there will be questions because you know there might be a need for one of the parents to move to a different location because of job opportunities or you know, a new love life and so on. So the point there is that really, even when you consider the fact that there might already be a judgment handed down by a court, either because it's after hearing or it's uh, based on a consent order, that may not be the end of the dispute actually. It may just be the beginning of you know, more disputes. So I, we need therefore to consider, even as we talk about statutory dispute resolution pra uh, processes, we need to think about the process, as well as the substance. What does what substance or you know outcome will these processes processes lead to? And we're going to be con uh, considering that as well. The other point I'd like you to consider uh, is really this point uh, that was suggested by Professor Robert Nukin, who currently is the dean of the US UCLA, or is it the Harvard, uh, you know, College of Law. Uh, when he talked about the bargaining in the shadow of the law, because even when we say that the focus, for example, if you base if you base it on interest-based bargaining, uh, which was suggested by professors uh, Roger Fisher and William Urey, and they talked about you know focus on the interest, the underlying interest behind any legal position, it is as if you know uh, negotiating parties simply consider what is might be good for them. Or you know what what you know it is as if there are unlimited opportunities to look for or that they can be really be creative uh, in terms of arriving at a solution to a dispute. When in fact, a lot even when you consider interests, it's difficult to get out of the legal system in the sense that when you negotiate with another party or you you know you engage in mediation and then negotiations in the context of mediation it is very difficult for any party or the lawyers involved in, a, in, in, in any dispute not to think about the law. I mean, why would you fully ignore the law? And, you know, which leads to questions about what is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement? So for example, if, if the law assumes, for example, that both parents naturally should uh, spend equal time with the children, if that's the, if that's the bottom line under the Family Law Act of 1975, why, you know, why would a parent in a parenting dispute, or for example, even consider the idea that a father can only spend, you know, one day with a child, so and you know, six days, so that the father only has one day with the child in a week and six days with the mom. It doesn't make sense because the father, for example, knows that based on the Family Law Act, there should be equal opportunities for both parents to spend time with, with a child. So it's really difficult to just, you know, um, think in the abstract and say that. When you try to settle a dispute, you simply focus on interests. You, a lot of these negotiations, uh, based on the very uh, widely cited journal article of uh, Professor Robert Luke in Bargaining the Shadow of the Law, a lot of these negotiations and ADR processes are always done within the shadow of the law. It's always the contemplation and idea that you know the, it, the law always applies. Now. Uh, one of the th other things we need to consider as well is that I was reading a, 
uh, one of the great, one of the books written by Professor Rupert Lukin as well. And one of the, the, the title of the book is actually Bargaining with the Devil. And what we need to ponder as well is that when, when I speak of the devil here, it's actually looking at the opponent of the other party as the devil, uh, not in a religious, not in a religious sense, but you know, probably in a more colloquial sense like that. You know, if you've got an enemy you're really angry uh, with, you actually tend to look at that person as a devil. So it's in a way dehumanizing the other person. But in, in, in real life, it, this can really happen, you know, in a very, in a, in a very acrimonious, for example, divorce or separation proceeding, it can be very common for, for both partners to look at the other as the devil. Uh, in, in a, when you have a commercial dispute where you, there, one of the parties feels that there has been dishonesty uh, in the process, it will be pretty common for the other part to think of the other as the devil and so on. So that's the other thing we need to ponder. Really, when we consider ADR processes, and we even consider the idea that you know, the parties must take genuine steps to resolve the conflict, really, you know, how likely are parties able to go beyond the way that they may dehumanize the other party because of very unpleasant experiences? Think about it, right? Can you really do that? Can you bargain with the devil? So, I mean, that, but that, that's a fantastic book by Professor Robert Nukin. I wish I had the time to talk about it. Now, um, as well, even though, uh, even when we talk about, you know, a lot of these statutes in this lecture video and we talk about uh, mediation, conciliation, case appraisal, and so on, and there's hardly any reference to the role of negotiations. The fact remains that even when you talk about mediation, which is ordered by the court or arbitration, or even in actual court proceedings, ever present is always the role of negotiation, which hasn't really been reflected in statute. In the sense that when you mediate, the only way for the parties to arrive at an agreement is actually through negotiation. The mediation only means that there is a third party trying to mediate individuals or two opposing, two or more opposing parties as they negotiate an agreement, okay? But it is not mediation per se that leads to the agreement. It is really the negotiation which is crucial there. You just need an arbiter or a mediator or a referee. It can also mean that even in the, in the course of uh, actual legal proceedings, prior to trial or even after trial or even during trial, it's pretty common for a judge or a tribunal member to say that, you know, why don't you take a break and try to discuss this and see if you could resolve it through negotiations. In which case, what it actually means is that you don't need a third party. It could just be the parties themselves or the parties with their lawyers seeking to resolve a dispute. So uh, that, that's just an emphasis. So even if, even when you speak of, you know, even when you talk about mediation and conciliation and arbitration and so on, always realize that a lot of the settlement or agreement that can happen leading to the resolution of a dispute actually occurs as a result of negotiations with the party. So that cannot be taken out of the equation when we talk about uh, alternative dispute resolution. We're also gonna, I'd also like you to ponder as well the benefits, concerns, and ethical issues as we go through a discussion of these uh, alternative alternative dispute resolution processes. Okay, so let's go back to that first point I raised earlier about the alternative dispute resolution processes. As I mentioned, if much of uh, so-called alternative dispute resolution processes is actually annexed to the court or annexed to the tribunal, is it still really alternative, okay? So we need to clarify that I think one way by which you can say that it's actually a, an alternative dispute resolution system is to say that it is an alternative to curial or judge determination or judge decision-making, or it is an alternative to a protracted and full-blown litigation. So I think that's one way of, of phrasing it, but it would be incorrect or simplistic to say that if it's alternative dispute resolution, if it's an alternative dispute resolution process, it necessarily is outside of the court system or it's necessarily outside of a court or legal proceeding. No, much of what we know to be alternative dispute resolution occurs within a legal proceeding or within a court proceeding or a tribunal proceeding. So that 
when you speak of an alternative dispute resolution, sometimes, and this was flagged by, uh, you know, the, by Spencer in his textbook, some would say that it should be co called additional dispute resolution. In other words, these are uh, dispute resolution processes which are in addition to uh, curial uh, determination, let's say curial judge determination or curial adjudication. We might also say that uh, these so-called alternative dispute resolution processes are complementary uh, to the curial or uh, curial determination or judge determination. Okay, so we're looking when we use the word alternative, it's in a in a broader sense. Alternative, in the sense that uh, it's alternative to protracted and full blown litigation or curial determination or adjudication. Curial means judge, okay, or judge like. So a judge is a judge, a tribunal member uh, is not a judge, but is judge-like. The reason why we emphasize judge-like is because uh, there would be requirements of the observance of the rules of natural justice or principles of procedural fairness, which I previously said, you know, we, we previously discussed. When you speak of rules of procedural fairness or rules of procedure, procedural, when you speak of the rules of natural justice or procedural fairness, it means one, there has to be, uh, uh, there is a duty uh, for a judge to hear, you know, all parties. And there, so meaning there has to be an opportunity to be heard. And as well as the fact that the judge must be objective, impartial, and be free of bias. Not only bias as in actual bias, but also apprehensions of bias or being viewed as being biased by the party or by the public. Okay. So having said that, Let's now begin to talk about the alternative uh, dispute resolution processes, uh, which are based on uh, statute. So one of them would be based on the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act of 1975. So again, just as a backgrounder, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal is a government agency uh, belonging to the executive branch of government. It reports actually to the uh, federal attorney general, or see, in other words, it's within the portfolio of the attorney general. And the task of the administrative appeals tribunal is to review administrative decisions or decisions made by the executive at the federal level. Uh, the reason why this has been important is that, you know, when a when an administrative or exe an executive agency makes a decision, and you have a lot of executive agencies, it could be the Australian Taxation Office. You're unhappy with this decision. It may have, you know, the ATO may have, you know, uh, imposed a higher tax on you, a tax rate, or may have refused a refund which you wanted. Um, you can have a decision by the uh, immigration officer or the immigration minister. You can have a decision uh, of Centrelink in which one of the parents uh, is unhappy with the uh, decision of, uh, in relation to child support, it could be decisions made by Centrelink in terms of you know certain benefits that a person may receive, etc. So there are a lot of administrative decisions. But the point before was that if there was an, a decision made by an administrative or executive agency which affected a citizen or a member of the public, the way to have a, re a decision reviewed was to simply ask for a review internally. And if did not, if that did not work, you need to go to the court which means it can be pretty expensive. Imagine if, you know, if the decision uh, of an executive, uh, if you're not happy, if you're aggrieved with the decision of the executive or an administrative agency, you have to go to court. You need to, to get a lawyer for that. But under the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act of 1975, the AAT was uh, created, which allows the AAT to review administrative decisions. You're gonna learn more about this when you study administrative law. Now, the, uh, we, so when you look at the AAT, it has ADR processes uh, under section three, uh, subsection one of the AAT Act. The ADR processes include conferencing, mediation, neutral evaluation, case appraisal, conciliation, and other process, procedures or services specified in the regulations. Of course, we're quite familiar with mediation. Uh, we were familiar with, we discussed mediation, I think in week two, we discussed conciliation in week five, we discussed neutral evaluation and case appraisal in week six. So we have familiarity about these things, we're not going to be discussing them again. Now, 
uh, under the AAT Act of 1975 Commonwealth, arbitration and court procedures for services are specifically excluded from the definition of ADR process. So you will note that the, AD, that the Administrative Appeals Tribunal for the purpose of ensuring a higher likelihood of resolution of disputes between a, the citizen and an administrative agency, they can refer the dispute through any of these ADR processes. Okay, so these ADR processes are ways by which the, a, the AAT Act considers uh, you know, to provide more opportunities for a dispute to be resolved. But one of the more common uh, ADR processes really is the conference, okay? And so if you've had the chance to have a, an administrative decision reviewed by the AAT, what usually happens is that the parties will be required to attend a conference. So this is the first case event in an application to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. It's usually scheduled around six to 10 weeks after the receipt of an application to review an administrative decision. It's usually conducted by conference registrars who are lawyers and or skilled ADR practitioners. Now, what is the conference at the AAT? The conference is an informal private meeting with a party so that both parties have to be there and or the representatives for the purpose of discussing and identifying the issues in dispute, identifying what if any further factual material needs to be put before the tribunal to enable it to make a decision on the merits, setting timetables, exploring the potential for settlement, and determining the co future conduct of the matter, which may involve a further conference, referral to another type of ADA process, and so on. Okay, so that's what the AAT conference, conference is. Now, but one of the things we need to realize is that in relation to ADR processes uh, at the AAT, the president or another tribunal member may direct that a conference be held or that a matter be referred to another ADR process. So that's a compulsory nature. It is within the power of the AAT president who heads the tribunal or another member what we would look usually call a judge, but they call they call, call tribunal members uh, to direct a conference or refer the matter to another ADR process. There is even no statutory requirement that the parties must consent to the conduct of any ADR process. It's, in other words, it's the, the the nature is compulsory. Now, on that point, this is the first things we need to examine when you think about the compulsory nature of a process, okay? Now, typically the view of disputants is that if they cannot arrive at an agreement because you know they just simply can't agree, they keep on, you know, the, the conflict becomes more heated, they keep on fighting, they've been at it for so long, it's simply beyond them to resolve the conflict. The common idea, the, the traditional idea is, you know, you have to give it to a, another person to make a decision. So it means that you know, if there is a dispute and the parties can't agree uh, to resolve the dispute or can't arrive at an agreement to the dispute, then we better bring it to the judge. Let's go to court, let the judge decide. Okay, you got that point? Now, the problem with the ADR process is that when an ADR process is triggered, meaning it's not, if, if in other words, if you don't, if, if it won't be the judge or a tribunal member that makes a decision, then, you know, I thought you go, I, I thought I was going to go to court or I was going to go to the tribunal to get a third party to make a decision on this because we can't agree. But through, because of an ADR process, it won't actually be the judge or the tribunal member making the decision. To an extent, it might still end up being the parties, sorry about my eyes, it might still be the parties trying to reach a decision through mediation or conference or negotiation and so on, okay? And so in a sense, you know, why make it compulsory? If the parties have already failed to resolve an agreement between themselves, and we know that even when you deal with mediation or conciliation, ultimately it will still be the parties who will have to reach an agreement, why bother? Okay, so, that, so that's one of the, the practical questions that have to be raised. now. But going back, uh, if you look at the fact that there is a compulsory uh, nature, uh, a compulsory process in relation to ADR in the AAT, it can happen that one of the tribunal members 
may actually conduct the ADR process. So, which in a sense is difficult. You might have mediation before a tribunal member, but you know that if the mediation fails, it can still be that tribunal member who then changes his role so that he becomes the judge. Now that can be difficult, right? Because in mediation in general, we're gonna be looking at the issue of confidentiality. Whatever is discussed in the, in, in the mediation or any of these ADR processes are considered to be confidential and they can be used in evidence. But if it is a tribunal member who mediates, who acts as a mediator in a mediation proceeding, for example, or even acts as a conciliator, well, certainly, sure, you say, you know, the evidence can be used, but the fact remains that the tribunal member cannot not know or cannot simply just, you know, forget or remove from his mind the fact that he was already aware of certain evidence or discussions which are intended to be confidential, which we're going to be covering in short while. In any event, if a member under the under Section 34F of the AAT Act, if a member conducts an ADR process in a matter, the act provides that he or she is not entitled to participate in the hearing of the same matter if any party notifies the tribunal prior to the hearing that they do not want the member to participate. So there is an option on the part of the members, or I mean the parties, to ask that the tribunal member who was who conducted the ADR not to be involved in, um, in uh, hearing the matter anymore. But in, in a practical sense, it's difficult for the parties to actually just say, oh, no, 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 the, the party, the member, you know, shouldn't, that particular member who conducted the ADR shouldn't be hearing this anymore. It's difficult because you might think that uh, the, the tribunal member, you know, showed some sympathy for you, but actually, but you don't really know. There might be some sympathy, but in terms of the evidence that the, and the law, the tribunal member, uh, you know, may look at things differently, but I mean, so that's a practical problem there. Now, moving on, in terms of evidence, uh, the rule under Section 34E of the AAT Act of 1975 is that any evidence of anything said or any act done at an ADR process is an inadmissible in any court or in any proceedings before a person authorized by a law of the Commonwealth or of a state or territory to hear evidence. So that means it applies to the AAT. At that, so if, an evident, if, any, if there's evidence of anything said or any act done at an ADR process, this is also inadmissible uh, in the AAT because the AAT is authorized, you know, is governed by the law of the Commonwealth. However, evidence is admissible in an AAT hearing if the parties uh, agreed to evidence being admissible or the evidence uh, in question is a case appraisal report or neutral evaluation report, and neither party objects to the report being admissible at the hearing. But you know this points to the rule on confidentiality of uh, proceedings uh, during uh, an ADR process. Well, one of the one of the cases that we should be considering, and this case is highlighted as well in the study guide, it's the case of Vazant Wang and Australian Postal Corporation. In this case, the tribunal was asked whether or not legal prof professional privilege had been waived or confidentiality had been waived by the fact that two letters from Mr. Wang to his former solicitors had been read out before an AAT conference registrar at a conference conducted pursuant to section 34A of the AAT Act and whether they should be released to the respondent for that or some other reason. So remember, if uh, under the previous provision, Section 34E, any evidence of anything said or any act done at the ADR process in, in, is inadmissible in any court or in any proceeding, including in the AAT, then the question is, you know, were those uh, letters which had been read out before an AAT conference registrar, uh, would they be covered by the rule of confidentiality? But the decision of the AAT on this was that the letters should be released to the respondent the use of the letters should be limited and their use should be restricted to particular matters in the administrative appeals tribunal. And the reason why this particular decision was arrived at by the administrative appeals tribunal is the fact that the administrative appeals tribunal is not really a court. It is a tribunal, as we said, it's really part of the uh, executive. And because as far as the administrative appeals tribunal concerned, its proceedings are meant to be 
informal. Uh, they don't really follow the strictly follow the rules of evidence. Uh, they're meant to be inexpensive, and they're meant to be a route towards a speedy uh, disposition of cases. And for this reason, uh, it was felt by, it was decided, not felt, but decided by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal that uh, the release of the letters to the respondent would further the, uh, the objectives of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act of 1975 Commonwealth. Now, one limitation we need to recall in relation to this particular decision of the AAT is that decisions of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal do not really form part of judicial decisions. They are not uh, part of legal precedent. And so it, it actually means that these decisions do not bind the courts. Uh, in a, they don't even bind the Administrative Appeals Tribunal because there is no idea of administrative precedents in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. However, uh, it, it can provide some guidance because if you were to have a, a, uh, a proceeding in the AAT by referring to this particular case, for example, you can make an argument that, you know, following, uh, you know, following a desire for consistency as a way of you know, uh, ensuring that the public or the legal profession is, a way, is aware of how particular legal questions are resolved, then there can be a reference to this particular case. However, this is not part of what is known as, uh, uh, as judicial proceeding. It isn't binding upon the courts. Now, so we've covered the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. We're not gonna be considering uh, ADR processes or, or statutory dispute resolution processes in relation to family law proceedings. So in relation to family law proceedings, we must be aware that there are two key matters there. One is in relation to parenting matters involving children. The other one is in relation to financial matters. So your property settlement between spouses. So uh, it is possible that um, if partners or couples separate, they may have children, in which case, uh, they may have minor children, in, in which case, if they don't end up with a parenting plan, uh, they may apply for a parenting order by applying to the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. Uh, or if they don't have children, but they have you know, properties acquired during the partnership or during the marriage, then they may apply for, uh, they may make an application to the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia uh, in relation to seeking an order pertaining to a property, property settlement or a financial matter. Uh, so I, I mentioned Federal Circuit Court and Family Court of Australia. Again, I may have mentioned it earlier, but that's because in the past, prior to September 2021, the Federal Circuit Court was a distinct court, court distinct from the Family Court, but there has been an amalgamation of the two courts as of September 2021, 20, so that you know have the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. Now, so in relation to uh, family law proceedings, for example, uh, in relation to matters involving children with some exceptions, a party cannot file any court proceeding unless they also file a certificate issued by a registered family dispute resolution practitioner under section 60I of the Family Law Act of 1975 to the effect that a family dispute resolution procedure has been held at some stage within the 12 months immediately preceding the filing of an initiating application. Now, these exceptions would be when there is there are allegations of uh, family violence or uh, abuse of the children. So in that case, uh, it's possible for the parties to forego uh, re a re referral to a family dispute resolution practitioner. So in other words, in these cases, mediation would not be necessary, uh, mainly because uh, as far as the law is concerned, as far as the Family Law Act of 19, uh, Family Act of 1975 Commonwealth is concerned, it may not be you know, appropriate to force a, uh, the, a party to have to undergo family dispute resolution when there is evidence of family violence or uh, child abuse. But in addition to the requirement that uh, parties seeking uh, you know, parenting orders must first undertake mediation through a family dispute resolution practitioner. 
There's, all, there's actually also an ADR in the form of arbitration under the Family Law Act of 1975. So a court, for example, can order uh, arbitration under Section 13E uh, of the Family Law Act in relation to a parenting matter or arbitration in relation to Section 13F, which is re a, uh, relating to relevant property or financial arbitration. We've obviously previously talked about arbitration in the context of the Uniform Civil uh, Commercial Arbitration Act across the states and territories of Australia. Uh, we know that when it comes to commercial transactions or commercial agreements where there is a dispute and they have a written agreement that uh, their dispute uh, should be <clears throat> referred to arbitration, then their uh, dispute will be referred to arbitration and governed by the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act of the various states. So, and the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act, which I think we discussed in, in week six or week five, uh, provided you know, the, the procedures and the process by which arbitration should be undertaken, including the, the powers of the arbitra arbitrator and the legal effect of arbitral powers. Now, this is, this, this is also arbitration, but this is arbitration not covered, obviously, by the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act, but it's arbitration in the sense that the parties are given an opportunity to present their evidence and plead their case uh, before an arbiter who isn't the judge, okay? So there is arbitration as well as an ADR process in family law proceedings. So this, we've discussed the EAT, we've discussed um, family, law, uh, family law proceedings. There's also, there are also EDR processes in relation to the Federal Circuit and the Family Court, governed mainly by the Federal Circuit Court of Australia Act of 1999 Common Law. Uh, under this particular law, the Federal Circuit Court of Australia Act of 1999 Common Law, uh, it can, the court can direct parties to use dispute resolution, which does not involve family law matters. If the court considers that it will help, uh, the parties to settle the dispute before it. This is governed by sections 23, 24, and 25. The dispute resolution processes are defined to include counseling, conciliation, mediation, arbitration, neutral evaluation, and case appraisal. We've already, you're, we're quite familiar with uh, these, uh, you know, EDR processes. Counseling, we know what counseling, we have a sense about what counseling is. Somebody is counseling the parties, giving them advice uh, on several relevant matters. Now, where a matter comes under the Family Law Act, the Federal Circuit Court adopts the relevant provisions of the Family Law Act in respect of the dispute resolution. Now, in addition, we also have the Civil Dispute Resolution Act of 2011 Commonwealth. And this particular statute governs legal proceedings before the, not only the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia, but also the Federal Court of Australia. And the objectives of the act are to ensure that as far as possible, people take genuine steps to resolve disputes before certain proceedings are instituted in the Federal Circuit Court and Family Court of Australia or the Federal Court, Court, Court of Australia, uh, promote a move away from an adversarial approach to litigation and improve access to justice by encouraging early dispute resolution. Uh, the focus of the succeeding uh, slides would be to talk about what exactly is meant by genuine steps to resolve the disputes. But try, try to ponder and bear in mind the question, would ADR really be a move away from an adversarial approach to litigation? How likely is that possible? Or could we say that parties under, undertake ADR and that actually are tied to the adversarial process that even when they undertake mediation or conciliation, they're still thinking along the lines of win-lose. If I'm gonna win, he has to lose. If he has to win, if I must have to lose. You know, not really adopting the win-win approach of interest-based negotiation, for example. And the objective, for example, of the Civil Dispute Resolution Act of 2012 is actually to improve access to justice by encouraging early dispute resolution. What exactly does it mean? Access to justice in the sense that because, you know, if, if a lot of the disputes are resolved, it means there will be less backlog or clogging of the judicial system. So it improves access in a sense to justice 
for future litigants, but how about the party for, by the party litigants themselves? What if they felt shortchanged because they feel they were compelled, they were coerced, they were forced to enter into, you know, to enter into a resolution of the dispute, even if they were not happy. Uh, for those who have had a chance to actually be in, uh, you know, to experience actual litigation in a court of law, you might have gotten the sense that the judge was forcing the parties or the judge was coercing the parties to reach agreement. The judge might say, you know, try to result, reach an agreement between yourselves because you might not be happy with the way that I arrived at the decision. That is, well, that's pretty coercive, isn't it? We, we know that's pretty, it's pretty threatening. It can even be punitive in a sense. And that therefore, in a sense, that threat from a judge or a tribunal member forces the parties to reach an agreement. But the question is, does that lead to justice? Does that lead to fairness? Does that lead to satisfactory outcomes that the parties are happy with or can live with? So these are open questions that uh, we should really be thinking about when we talk about statutory dispute resolution processes. Okay, now, the Civil Dispute Resolution Act, as I mentioned, applies to all general federal law matters in the Federal Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia, unless the proceedings the proceeding is excluded. Uh, there are certain proceedings which are excluded, such as uh, those relating to a civil penalty or a criminal offense, appeals, ex parte proceedings, and proceedings involving a vexatious litigant. Uh, certain Commonwealth Acts have also been excluded, particularly where the Act establishes a very specific dispute resolution regime of its own, such as the Family Law Act of 1975, the Fair Work Act of 2009, and so on. Okay. Let's go back to the question about genuine steps to resolve a dispute. Under Section 41A of the Civil Dispute Resolution Act of 2011, Commonwealth, for the purposes of this act, a person takes genuine steps to resolve a dispute if the steps taken by the person in relation to the dispute constitute a sincere and genuine attempt to resolve the dispute, having regard to the person's circumstances and the nature and circumstances of the dispute. So what exactly does that mean? Now, as well, we need to note that under Section 9 of the law, a lawyer acting for a person who is required to file a genuine step statement must advise the person of the requirement and assist the person to comply with the requirement. So there is a legal obligation as well on the lawyer. Now, what are examples of genuine steps to resolve a dispute? Examples are notifying the other person of the issues that are or may be in dispute and offering to discuss them with a view to resolving the dispute responding appropriately to any such notification, providing relevant information and documents to the other person to enable the other person to understand the issues involved and how the dispute might be resolved, considering whether the dispute could be resolved by a process facilitated by another person, including an alternative dispute resolution process, if such a process is agreed to agreeing on a particular person to facilitate the process and attending the process, or attempting to negotiate with the other person with a view to resolving some or all the issues in dispute or authorizing a representative to do so. Now, what is the effect of uh, failing to file a genuine steps statement or taking, failing to take genuine steps to resolve a dispute? Under the law, a failure to, take, a failure to file a genuine steps statement in, statement in proceedings does not invalidate the application instituting the proceedings a response to such an application to the so it doesn't invalidate it, but there is an effect in relation to award of costs because under section 12 of the law, in exercising a discretion to award costs in a civil proceeding in an eligible court, the court judge or other person exercising the discretion may take account of a whether a person was required to file a genuine step statement, uh, file a such a statement, and so on. Okay, and there's also uh, under section three, subsection three of section 12. If a lawyer is ordered to bear costs personally because of failure to comply with section nine, the lawyer must not recover the cost from the lawyer's client. In other words, under subsection two, the lawyer can be award, uh, can be assessed costs for failing to comply with the duty under section nine. And so how is that defined or how, you know, how is that interpreted? It is said that the, the, the concept of genuine steps to resolve a dispute is deliberately flexible so there is no uh, 
clear limitation on what it means. It's really broad. So there were a lot of examples uh, given as to what can constitute genuine steps to resolve a dispute. Uh, if you look at the Federal Attorney General's Department website, it states that what constitutes a genuine step is up to the parties to determine within the context of their particular dispute. Okay, so we've covered the uh, statutory dispute resolution practices, uh, processes at the level of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, we've considered the Family Law Act. We've also covered the uh, Federal Circuit and Family Court. And we've covered as well the Civil Dispute uh, Resolution Act uh, in the previous uh, lecture uh, slides. What we're gonna do now towards the end of this lecture video is to consider why court annex ADR, you know, what really is the value of court annex ADR? When I say court annex, again, I meant in a broader sense of a court, could be tribunal annex. The advantages are many. Uh, one is that if you use ADR, it means it's speedier, it's, the cost is lower, it's more efficient, more user-friendly means of resolving disputes. Imagine, and this is an important point, if the parties cannot resolve their dispute, and they are compelled that to, you know, to bring it before the judge and the judge will now have to make a determination or an adjudication of the dispute. It means this can only happen after protracted hearings. That can take a while. It can take between two years to five years, or in some cases, even 10 years, depending on the complexity of the case and the amount of evidence that are involved. So it won't be speedy. If you, if you wait for court adjudication, it can take ages. However, if the, pro, if the parties succeed in uh, settling the dispute through ADR, it will be speedy. It can be done quickly, less than a year from the time that, uh, that the dispute arises. Of course, the costs are lower if they are successful because imagine having a protracted legal proceeding in a court that you need to pay for lawyers, you know, there's a the cost of time and there could be a potential cost award because of the common law rule that costs follow the event. In a sense, it's also more efficient and more user-friendly because the, the, the beauty, as we said, of ADR is that uh, it is the parties themselves who, at the end of the day, uh, usually uh, arrive at uh, the agreement or the outcome of the dispute. Of course, that's not the case when it comes to arbitration or adjudication. But in general, when you speak of mediation and conciliation and negotiation, it would be more user-friendly because it's the parties really uh, trying to reach an agreement. One of the better books really to read about this with a lot of stories is the book by Robert Nukin, M-N-O-O-K-I-N, uh, in his book, Bargaining with the Devil, because he provides clear stories, as well as the book by, by the way, by Gary Friedman on um, understanding-based mediation. There are a lot of stories there on um, the beauty of using uh, ADR for the purpose of settling disputes. As well, ADR, court annex ADR would be less intimidating and more informal because it's done not before the judge. So if it's done before the mediator or conciliator, it's going to be less intimidating for the, par the parties and certainly more informal. The parties then are also able to fashion their own outcomes. What is in law is sometimes considered uh, called private ordering. It's called private ordering because the parties are in a position to privately order or resolve uh, their dispute by agreement. Uh, the court annex ADR can clarify and or narrow the issue so that if it has to go to court, at least the issues have been clarified or narrowed down. More importantly, it is an opportunity to reflect on the dispute and the story behind the dispute. Uh, relatedly, it's about an opportunity to stop and pause. So sometimes people are so embroiled in the conflict, they're so caught up in the conflict, that you know, to them, and especially if, if they have dehumanized the other party, they just think that they want to win at all costs. It's 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 uh, what is sometimes called a pyrrhic victory. Uh, you yes, you you win, but you know, if if by winning you've lost everything, what kind of victory is that? So, um, in these cases, the advantage of the court annex ADR is that it allows the parties to just stop and pause. It's like 
in those road rage incidents, like, you know, you're very angry with another person who's cut you off and you just want to beat the hell out of that person, stop and pause, right? Instead of, you know, allowing the conflict to become bigger and uncontrollable, it's best to stop and pause. So the court annex ADR, in a sense, allows the parties to just pause, stop and pause and reflect on the dispute. You know, what's the story behind the dispute? How come this is getting worse? And so in other words, the point there is that you allow your analytical, analytical mind to stop the emotions which have essentially hijacked the brain. For a lot of people involved in conflict, it's oftentimes the emotion which have really overtaken the mind. People can't think clearly, you know, they're just so angry, they can't look for an, an, an analytical or a logical way out of the dispute. But with the court annex ADR, okay, somebody will probably say, hang on, okay, let's think about this. Is there a way to resolve this dispute? We're aware, you know, how, of how difficult things are, how heated things have been. There has been so much bad blood. But if you don't, you know, if you allow this problem to foster, and to, to fester and to continue, what are the outcomes? You know, what will happen? Is this really the way you would like to live the rest of your lives and so on? So it's an opportunity to think and pause. It can also be an opportunity to reflect on interests rather than legal positions. So the problem with the legal position, it's a single legal position. This is where I stand. I want my child to be with me on these days. There's only one. And that, you know, it's a position. It's either you get it or you don't get it. That's very problematic. The problem with legal position is that it's pretty fixed. But when you examine the underlying interests behind the legal position, you might say that, you know, this legal position about wanting that the child to be with the father or the mother on a set number of days uh, is because of, you know, the interest that the father thinks, you know, uh, he'd be, he, he would be an irresponsible father if he doesn't spend enough time with the child or that, you know, the father wants really to spend time with the child because otherwise he won't be able to develop a meaningful relationship. It could be financial reasons. The father thinks that if the, if the child has to be with the mom, the child might not, uh, might not thrive because of economic difficulties in the part of the mom or because the mom is evil or whatever. So, but the point there is it allows the parties to assess what exactly are the interests underlying the, the legal positions. The court annex ADR can also be an opportunity for open and confidential dialogue, discussion and negotiations, because we recall that in the context of an actual hearing or an actual mention before a court, the discussions there are not confidential. They're gonna be part of the evidence. And uh, when you come before the judge, that's not really a time to really be negotiating because anything you say can be used against you. And it's always in the context of, you know, of the law. So you'd rather take it out of the court setting uh, in order to explore open and confidential dialogue. Now, so we, we discussed the good things about court annex ADR. What exactly are the concerns? We've already said that uh, following uh, the book by Roger Fisher and William Yuri on Getting to Yes, we've already initially talked about you know, uh, interest-based negotiation, focusing on interests rather than positions, looking at the interests underlying certain legal positions and the assertion of rights. The problem, however, really is that even when you talk about Port Annex ADR, and even when you know, some might say, uh, don't focus on the law, focus on the underlying interests. Following the book of, uh, following the journal article of Professor Robert Nukin, it's really difficult to uh, disentangle oneself from the concept of the law. You can't really say, oh, I'm gonna, you know, just look at the interest, my own interest, or uh, we're gonna consider your own interest, let's disregard the law. That's not really realistic because when anyone negotiates, the person negotiating always has the conception of the law in mind because if the law says this, at the minimum, this is what I get, that no matter what, this is what the law will give me, that is what is known as BATNA, the better alternative, better alternative to a negotiated agreement. You know that if the negotiation fails or if the ADR fails, you know that because of the law, this is at the minimum what you will always get. And so you're never gonna allow yourself to negotiate below that because you know that you're protected by the law. The law protects you in a certain way or provides certain guarantees. That's your data, for example. And with that, therefore, it's really difficult to uh, say that uh, interest-based negotiations can be done 
outside of uh, the law because any bargaining will always be in the shadow of the law. In, in other words, any ADR process is still largely law driven. It's still largely influenced by the law. So that's just one of the one of the concerns. Yes, you might say that you're trying to uh, get the parties out of you know out of the judge, uh, but uh, that a lot of the discussions and negotiations will still take place within the context of the law. The problem as well is that even if it's, you know, even in the context of a court annex ADR, and we say that the ADR is alternative to protracted litigation in many cases, uh, parties still need to consult their lawyers. Uh, if they reach an agreement, for example, they need to seek independent legal advice. So in other words, in that case, any settlement or any discussion will still always be influenced by, by, by lawyers. But because lawyers are uh, trained uh, in the adversarial process, it can be quite difficult for lawyers to think for, of the interest of the other party. They will, of course, interest, they will always think always of the interests of their own client. And, uh, you know, so therefore, uh, it might be natural for a lawyer to advise the, the, the client that, oh, you're getting a raw deal, you're getting a bad deal. If, you know, if you, if you litigate this, uh, this is the likely outcome and so on. And so therefore the problem there is that it's kind of a, a balancing act. Uh, on the one hand, there's a desire to end the litigation. You, you know, in a sense, maybe cut your losses, uh, even if it's not the, the optimum outcome, but it's probably an outcome you can live with. But then when you try to present your uh, proposal to a lawyer and the lawyer has to give legal advice on the basis of his knowledge of the law, and his idea about what the probable legal outcome will be, uh, you know, th that there can be issues in, in that process. You might also have inappropriate lawyer behavior who focuses more on the litigation side because that's how he has been trained or is really interested in inflaming the conflict because that's the way they make more money. So for example, uh, I'll, I'll, give you a I'll, I'll give you a typical example. I was uh, talking with a lawyer friend of mine and uh, somebody came to him. Uh, I was surprised, said, okay, so you provided legal advice in relation to these students who, were, who claimed that they were unfairly dismissed by their employer. Uh, the legal advice was for free, okay. So it was, it, essentially it began as an unfair, lab, uh, an, an unfair dismissal case. You should have gone to the Fair Work Commission. But what this lawyer did was say, okay, hang on, because of this incident where you felt like you were unfairly dismissed, did, did it lead to some psychological distress? Did it lead to depression and so on? Were there any other, you know, things that, did, did you feel like you, you had any physical injuries as a result of working too hard because you had to lift physical objects and so on? The point I'm making is that this, and this is a very good lawyer friend of mine, the point I'm making is that this is an example, and I'm not really saying it's inappropriate, but this is an example of uh, lawyer behavior that can inflame the conflict. The, conf the, the legal conflict, the legal dispute initially was just about uh, an unfair dismissal, which certainly you know, would be brought before the uh, Fair Work Commission. But now, because this friend of mine happens to be a personal injury lawyer, uh, was looking at the possibility that there could be a personal injury case that could be filed if, you know, as a result of the unfair as a result of the action or behavior of the employer, this led to depression, trauma, and so on. Okay, but that's an example of uh, concerns. Uh, if you begin to engage lawyers, and of course, at some point, you're going to be lawyers yourselves. The other concern about court annex ADR is that when you think about it initially, you know, um, much of court annex ADR is really with the view that uh, it, it's meant to uh, increase uh, increase opportunities for people to access justice. It's about accessing justice. And really it's about you know, uh, reducing the backlog or the clogging of uh, cases in the judicial system. So the point there is that there oftentimes, as I mentioned earlier already, there is pressure on the part of the judge or a tribunal member for the parties to reach an agreement. There are threats, veiled threats, pressure. You need to settle this, otherwise, you know, the next time I'm going to hear this is going to be one year from now. That's pressure. Or, you know, you don't, you, you might not be happy with the outcome. Or, you know, if you end up losing, you'll be assessed cost. So there are various threats and pressure coming from the bench or from the judge. So therefore, in relation to court annexed ADR, 
it's you might almost say that the court annex ADR is just a way to kind of shoo the parties away from the judge or from the from the from the court system. And so that therefore the focus is not really on the parties, um, you know, achieving justice or a sense of fairness or protecting the interest. The focus is really ultimately on case management. So these are some of the concerns when you think about court annex ADR. For those who have experienced, you know, court proceedings, some of them may come out of the experience saying that, you know, they felt pressured to reach an agreement. Uh, in a sense, that might really be true because maybe, you know, you'd rather uh, re come up with a resolution uh, among yourselves rather than leave it to a judge or tribunal member whose decision you might not be happy with. But certainly the pressure is there. Okay, so, so with that, on completing this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the key legislation is trailer that enshrines ADR processes, how ADR works in connection with the AAT, how ADR works in connection with family law and civil disputes, the benefits and concerns about court ordered ADR and ethical practices in court ordered ADR. And with that, I thank you for watching this lecture video. Bye.